So the time on my laptop is 2.40 a.m., which is the time back home for me. Uh, I'm from British Columbia, uh, west coast of Canada. I live in a suburb. Uh, this is a camera between my place and my neighbor's house. Uh, we call this camera the Animal Highway uh, because we get visitors on a regular basis. Uh, and I only knew how regular after I put this camera in because they're usually pretty stealthy. This is a Wednesday morning in my neighborhood. Wednesday is garbage day. It's about 5.30 a.m. And this guy just drives, he's about 250 kilos. And he drops by just to see if I put my garbage out early. Uh, now, of course, I'm in Norway, so you know our terrains are not that dissimilar. I don't think bears impress you all that, because this freaks the Australians out. I mean, they have all the poisonous spiders and snakes in the world, but no bears. The one that upsets people who, who live in, in, uh, in environments where there are animals nearby is, uh, is this one, which is just from this spring, and much, much more recent. Uh, and this is a, uh, a juvenile mountain lion. So 30 kilos worth of kitty cat, and uh, he, he, we didn't see him again. He came through just the one time. Uh, everybody gets, you know, bears we live with. It's normal. Uh, and there are good bears and bad bears, and the bad bears don't last very long. But there are no good mountain lions. And so we, uh, we discourage them pretty heavily. Uh, and that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, that's a little bit of introduction to me. That's where I'm from, and, uh, you know, we'll always live with wildlife. I, I make a lot of podcasts. Any Donna Rocks listeners in the room? Oh, my goodness. Okay, wow. So, yeah, episode 1640 goes up tomorrow, uh, and, uh, or I think it's now today. Um, and uh, Carl started that back in 2002, before the word podcast existed. Uh, so that's why we call it the Internet Audio Talk Show, and we've, we've been putting out uh, shows ever since. We'll record several. I've got a couple this afternoon. We'll get a few from, from here as well. Uh, I also exercise my IT brain with Run As Radio since uh, 2007. So if you're not listening to a podcast, they're all free to download. Uh, I sell advertising on them. That's how the business works. And this talk comes from .NET Rocks because there is one set of .NET Rocks episodes we do called the Geek Out episodes. So this is whatever geeky subject the audience is interested in. We have a voting system. And I am a researcher by nature. Uh, that's something I simply enjoy doing and uh, tend to keep notes in OneNote about things all the time anyway. And actually making the Geek Outs forces me to finish, to actually put together a story and, and, and talk for a while. And that's, this talk came originally from a geek out I did in 2017 called the Moon Base Geek Out, where there was a lot of interest around the moon lately, and maybe we could pull a, a, a conversation about that, which yes, I could do, and uh, had a good time making that. And then NASA called, which is a good day. <laughs> When NASA calls, they're like, hi, you know, we've been listening to your podcast. We're like, okay, that's weird. <laughs> and we really like your moon base show. I'm like, cool, that's great. It's like, have you ever, uh, ever thought about doing a presentation on it? And I'm like, well, I guess, you'd... do you know about PowerPoint? Because we, we like PowerPoints at, at NASA. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I could probably make something work for PowerPoint. Like, well, we'd love to invite you down. And so, yeah, in October, I went to the Ames Research Center and did a presentation of their stuff. I'm like, this is your stuff. So, yeah, we like how you tell it. So, okay. I will tell a story about your stuff to you. <laughs> uh, and I think an important part of that whole conversation, anything when we talk about uh, space science, is that we're, we're struggling with the science fiction aspects. We've got a lot of movies and things that make us skip over the hard parts of actually doing things in space. It's a lot more fun than the real efforts that are involved. And, uh, and I, I take pictures like this to remind myself of what's real and what isn't real. This is an amazing photograph, right? And it looks fake, and it's not. So the first thing you have to ask is, who took this picture? Because look what it is. That is the far side of the moon clearly not the dark side of the moon, but the far side of the moon in front of the Earth. This is a picture taken by the Discover satellite, which is actually a solar observation satellite, which is sitting in the L1 position, which is a stable gravitational location, 
between the sun and the earth. And it's positioned there so that it has a really great view of the sun, and it's taking measurements of the sun's behavior and transmitting back to earth. And somebody was clever enough to put a camera on the other side of it, and it always has a complete view of the disk of the earth. And so you have this lovely photo from about 1.6 kilometers away from the earth of this full frame of the earth. And every so often, the moon whizzes through the frame. Now, there's, this camera is not a color camera. It is a, a, a monochromic camera, but they put different lenses in front of it. It's on a rotating disc. And so when they want to take a color photograph, what they actually do is they take a picture, then they rotate to a different color, then they take another picture, and they rotate to another, they take it, they do four of them, and then composite those together. Now, generally, the moon is not, the earth is not changing very much, so that, you don't notice that that happens. But the moon is moving so rapidly here that the 30 seconds for each one of those pictures to be taken is showing up as a green blur on one on the, on the right side edge of the moon. That blur is because the green photo was taken much later than the other photos. It was almost, a minute of, uh, of almost two minutes apart. That's what real pictures look like. They have those distortions because space isn't easy and the reliable sensors are a lot simpler than what we have in our phones. But I love this picture because it has all of those things hidden away in it. And we're going to talk about Lagrange points because they're important. Uh, if, when I first wrote this back in, in, in 2017, there was the Lunar X Prize that Google was helping to sponsor. For tw they had $20 million to anyone that could put a device on the moon, provide video from the moon service, and then move to another location and provide more video. They presumed it would be a rover, that you put a vehicle on the moon and you move it to a different location, although a bunch of people actually tried to build hoppers. Now, nobody collected this prize. And it was an X prize, very much like um, Lindbergh crossing the Atlantic, which was the Orteg prize, or the more recent X prize winner, which would be in 20, 2004, when Spaceship One flew as a privately owned vehicle that could go into space. Although, there is a vehicle from the XPRIZE that recently headed towards the moon, and we'll talk about it a little later. But they, you know, we're still trying to commercialize the moon. Most people only know anything that's gone on with the moon from the Apollo projects. So this was an initiative from the United States, and the curio you know, just coincidentally, we're a month away from the 50th anniversary of humans first landing on the moon. We also happen to be 75 years after D-Day, and those two things have a lot to do with each other because the, uh, the, the end of World War II is what led to the Cold War, and the Cold War is what created the Apollo missions. When the Soviet Union put Sputnik up and scared the Americans, the Americans' answer was to spend a lot of money. And ultimately, they developed this remarkable spacecraft that could fly to the moon and uh, ultimately did land on it several times, and then they stopped. Now, they wrapped it in this umbrella of NASA as a civilian organization for the efforts of science, but in reality, this was a military mission. Virtually everyone that flew on Apollo were, were military test pilots, with them, like, basically one notable exception, a, a geologist. Everyone else was military, and in fact, once they had achieved the mission, there was really no reason to continue, which is why they ultimately cut the mission back dramatically. Because the more times they tried it, the more likely things were going to go wrong. You, the thing to remember is how quickly all this happened. Sputnik flew in 1957. So 12 years after the end of World War II, we have the first time that humans have lofted something into orbit. Five years after that is when JFK does his famous Rice University speech, we choose to go to the moon, uh, but understand that that was, in the same, that was in the same month as the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? I mean, the Cuban Missile Crisis is arguably the closest that humanity came to having a nuclear war. We were right on the precipice of this. And so the idea that we could stop shooting missiles at each other and instead use those missiles in another activity that showed the dominance of your system, seemed like a really good idea. Fewer people will die this way. And I say fewer for a reason, because it did cost a number of lives to, to go to the moon. Not on the moon, largely by luck, but we did cost lives. The last man on the moon was Gene Cernan, and that's in 1972, and he was a naval aviator. 
although he was with a guy named Harrison Schmidt, who was a, who was a geologist. And as he left the moon, he said, America's challenge, the America's challenge of today will forge man's destiny of tomorrow. We just have to decide when tomorrow is. Uh, but Harrison Smith's the guy I like. Uh, he went a little nuts after going on the moon, but he was a geologist. In fact, he trained the other astronauts about geology to find useful things on the moon. And he was originally supposed to be on Apollo 18, but they canceled Apollo 18. And so they moved him up to Apollo 17, so you fly on the last mission. The problem is that training pilots on how to look for rocks doesn't go that well. Because when you're looking for the exception, which is what most science is, most science is not, Eureka, I have found it. Most science is, what the heck is that? And that's what Harrison Smith had going for him. He knew geology. He had a PhD in geology. And so when he walked around looking at rocks, he knew what normal was, and he knew what abnormal was. And so he found, by far, the most important rock of the entire Apollo missions. They brought back thousands of pounds of rock, but this little guy who's about this big is by far the most important rock that they found on the moon. Why? Because it's an unshocked piece of olivine, which only a geologist would be excited about. <laughs> now, one of the questions we tried to answer when we went to the moon is how did the moon form? It is an extremely large moon relative to the size of the Earth compared to anything else in our solar system. And now that we're starting to look beyond our solar system, we're finding that's pretty rare as well. And one of the most popular theories is called the Theia theory, that another body during early stages of formation of the Earth collided with the Earth, and the two sort of mashed together and bounced apart, and the moon is from the debris of that impact. Now, if that was true, and that was the only thing that formed the moon, we would have only shocked rock. What this rock indicates is that there was volcanic activity on the moon late enough in its formation that a volcano actually erupted and threw this particular rock onto the surface of the moon. Impact rock looks different. That's what we mean when we say shocked rock. This is high temperature, high pressure formed rock formed volcanically, not by impact. And it makes the whole conversation of how the moon formed and what its value is and how it behaves a much more complicated theory. So one of the points this speaks to, this rock, is that there is a metallic core in the moon. It's possibly not molten anymore like our Earth is, but it is there, and we need to do that more research on that. Now we've People say we've been to the moon, there's no reason to go back. And these are the six sites that we've been to. And notice they're sort of clustered together. There's a lot of the moon we haven't looked at. Now, part of this was they only wanted to land on the side of the moon that faces the Earth so they could stay in communication. They never tried to land on the other side of the moon. And they only landed during the day. It's a 14-day day and a 14-day night in any relatively equatorial location on the moon. The, to the furthest part of these two missions between 12 and 17, that's about 1,700 kilometers. So here's a thought. If you were trying to understand the Earth and you only landed in a roughly 1,700 kilometer oval, well, that means you could put every one of your landings on the Sahara Desert. Do you understand the Earth now? So we've only gathered a few rocks and a few scientific measurements from a very few locations on the moon. We have not explored very much of the moon at all, at least with the Apollo missions. And they cut the Apollo missions short largely because of this device. This machine worked flawlessly. This is the lunar lander, and it never failed, which is good, because if there had been any failures of this vehicle at all, those two astronauts would have died. The, the, the LEM was capable of sustaining life for three days, and the minimum travel time from the Earth to the moon is three days. So if they had botched a landing or collapsed a piece of landing gear and gone a bit sideways, they could not have gotten another ship there in time to save them. The sides of the vehicle were so thin that they actually talked about securing the tools because if you dropped a tool, it might go through the wall. It's a very lightweight vehicle. It's also the largest vehicle ever landed on another body at roughly 15 metric tons, right? The largest thing we've ever landed on Mars is the Curiosity rover at one metric ton. 
The precision of the landing system for this was somewhere in a 20 kilometer radius. So you can't pick your spots, right? We have limits to the technology. Now, admittedly, this is old technology. This is 1960s technology. But it did do its job. It beat the Soviets out. The Soviets were trying, although we didn't really find until after the Cold War that the Soviets had a moon rocket called the N1, which I wish we'd seen this thing fly. Because they tried four times, and it blew up all four times. Now, they were racing. They were cutting corners the same way the Apollo missions were to try and get ahead of the Americans. The rocket was profoundly advanced. And just as an interesting, you know, uh, swords into plowshare side. So the principal engine on the N1, on the, on the bottom stage, is an engine called the NK-33. It's a small, very efficient engine. And after the fourth attempt of the N1, when it was clear that the Soviets were not going to beat the Americans onto the surface of the moon, the project was canceled, and it was typical of the Soviets of the time, ordered all equipment destroyed, and they were disobeyed. The operator of the rocket, in, uh, Roscosmos, actually stored all the engines away. There was about 60 of these engines for a few more flight attempts of the N1. And in the 1990s, when the Americans were trying to find something to buy for, from the Russians to keep their economy running, they found those engines. And they bought them. <laughs> and they flew American rockets up until just very recently. Aerojet Rocketdyne flies the NK-33 as an engine called the AJ-12 in the Antares rocket. They also bought the RD-180, which is more best, better known for the Atlas V. But just the, all these things tie together. Right? Most of the American uh, rockets, with the notable exception of the Saturn V, were all ex-ICBMs. They were nuclear weapons, where they took the weapon off, stuck people on instead, and flew them in space. Now, just because the space race ended in 1972 doesn't mean that work in space stopped, or even work around the moon stopped. Not a lot happened. I mean, we really, uh, when you talk about the end of the Soviet Union going in the 80s, you have to talk about this thing called the Strategic Defense Initiative. And Ronald Reagan, the, the, the uh, president at the time in the early 80s, uh, announced it as a defensive shield that we're going to build around America that could deflect any incoming nuclear weapons. Right? Everybody else called it the Star Wars Initiative. Uh, and it was frightening to the Soviets. One of the reasons the Soviets believed that the Americans could build this advanced system with all of these satellites that could shoot down weapons in space is that they'd flown to the moon in six years from announcement to delivery. So if they could do that, maybe they could do this. Now, most of what you see in this crazy diagram never got built, although I do have a soft spot for the name Brilliant Pebble. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. And Brilliant Eyes. But in the 80s, we were just starting to get serious computing power, and so they thought you know, with automation they could build this array of sensors that could literally detect any launches of, of weapons and shoot them down in flight. And some of this hardware actually got built. You know, the Soviet Union collapsed in, in 89, but that, and they largely shut the project down. But one particular piece, the Brilliant Pebble, they built a test article for it. And when the initiative was over, they went to NASA and said, hey, we have this spacecraft, and we don't really need it anymore, and there's a bunch of interesting tech on this. Would you like to use it? Put it to work. Not the first time that it happened to NASA. I mean, that's really where the Hubble Space Telescope came from as well. NASA bought, took it on. It was a joint initiative between the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization and NASA, and they launched it as a, as a mission called the Deep Space Program Science Experiment. But they, all, they mostly called it Clementine. And the reason they called it Clementine is because the mission was to fly to the moon, orbit the moon for a while, and then to fly on to an asteroid, at which point it would be lost and gone forever. Hence the name Clementine. And actually, this experiment did the first radar-reflected tests on the poles of the moon, reflected back to the Earth, that indicated there was something denser on the poles than they thought. We'd later come to know this was water. But the first indications that there was anything interesting on the poles of the moon came from this, again, literal sword into plowshare from the end of the Cold War. By the way, when I did this at NASA, one of the guys that was in the room at NASA was a guy named Dan Andrews. And Dan Andrews has actually flown stuff to the moon. He's a chief engineer on a bunch of different projects, a wildly impressive man. I mean, a little, you know, 
It's like when your boss is sitting in the audience. I'm a little freaked out by the whole thing, right? And I got the chance to meet him after the talk. His father worked on this. And he didn't know that it had come from SDI. So in between the time that I did the presentation, I got to meet him, he called his dad and said, is this true? And his dad said, yeah. <laughs> and then he, when I came to the room, he says like, so you taught me something today, which I did not expect him to say. Uh, after this mission, the next mission to the moon, which launched from the same facility that I was at, the Ames facility, was a project called Lunar Prospector. So this is in the 90s. So Clementine was in the 80s. In the 90s, out of the space shuttle, they flew this relatively small spacecraft, and it did orbits uh, around the moon and mapped out potential ore bodies, concentrations of certain uh, uh, elements, and again, they were trying to figure out, is there really water on the poles? Is something there? They didn't have good sensors for it, but there was, again, some weird reflections from the spectrometer that sort of indicated there might be ions up there. But the real spacecraft that came out of Ains, the one that made the huge difference, is this thing called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Now, this flew in 2009, and it's still up there today. It just had its 10th anniversary. It was designed to last a year, so it's doing pretty good. It's done something like 40,000 orbits around the moon, and it's mapped it in great detail. If you've ever seen those videos of, uh, of, of the moon uh, actually looking in detail at locations for the Apollo, where you actually see the footprints and the, uh, the, land, and the descent stage, all of those sort of things, those are all lunar reconnaissance orbiter photos. So that, the LRO has been doing that, taking those pictures, and does to, to this day. There was another mission on, the, uh, uh, on that same launch of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter in 2009. And that was a mission that Dan Andrews actually worked on. That mission was called uh, LCROSS, or the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite. So the principal payload was the LRO, the one that takes all that fantastic photos and is still operational today. But they had a little excess payload available. And there's like, given you had this extra payload, like what other mission would you do? And so the idea was this. We really want to know if there's water on the moon. Given that you have this much payload, how would you figure it out? And so what they came up with was a two-part mission. At the back there is the second stage of the Atlas rocket. It's called the Centaur Booster. It's about the size of a bus. Now, it's mostly a fuel tank, although it has an engine attached to it as well. And then on top of that is this little hexagonal guy, which is called a spacecraft bus, and it's about the size of a Volkswagen. And it would have a set of sensors on it. And so what they did is after the LRO had launched towards the moon, they kept these two pieces together and it orbited between the moon and the earth for about a year. And they got all of the fuel out of the tank of the Centaur booster, so it was completely clean. And then once they were sure it was properly prepped, they changed its orbit so that it would impact the moon at a very precise location, a location in a continuously shaded crater on the moon. The theory being that there are spots on the moon that get no sunlight whatsoever and ice is concentrated there. So their basic plan was to fling this bus at the moon to hit that shaded spot, kick up a plume of dust, and this little hexagonal gizmo, which is about two minutes behind it, gets to take some pictures through that dust to measure whether there's water or not, and then it too smacks into the moon and breaks into little pieces. This was the plan. <laughs> and it worked. The Centaur booster impacted uh, two minutes ahead of the control unit so that it kicked up this plume of dust and they used the spectrometer on it to beam back measurements of what was in the dust. And what they found was not only water, but also a set of other hydroxyls and radicals. So stuff that shouldn't be on the moon. We think from the Apollo missions that the moon is this sun-blasted rock. And here were hydroxyls peroxides, water ice, nitrides, all coming out of this plume for a minute, <laughs> and then bang. And Dan Andrews told me something else when we were meeting over this particular one, which is that they, you gotta think about how precise the calculation was to throw this bus, moving it somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 miles an hour, into this spot on a crater, you know, roughly the size of a, of a, of a stadium. It's a pretty accurate shot. 
they knew down to the millisecond when it should impact based on the radar map it had done. They knew exactly where the surface was, they knew exactly when it would impact, so they knew exactly when to take the picture so they could get a picture of the entire plume and where that plume would be. And the bus hit late by about 20 milliseconds. Now, for an engineer, that's a big deal. How, how could we be late? How, you can't be late, we map this. Well, radar maps to a surface. What if that surface wasn't solid? Right? They were waiting for the impact. They have sensors on the moon that measure impacts, and the me impact came late. The current theory is that not only is there ice in those continuous shaded areas, but it's growing. It's a crystalline structure that's large enough that it reflected radar, that it was meters and meters deep. It reflected radar, but the bus passed right through it before it actually hit hard enough ground to set off those seismic sensors which is really cool to think about. Think about the way that snowflakes form and that these could be these snowflake-like structures hidden in these spots on the moon. There's a lot we don't know. And this was a heck of an experiment for 2011, but there's still, we only know so much. They followed that mission up with another one called LADI, or the Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer. Now, lunar atmosphere, you say? Well, not an atmosphere like we know an atmosphere. It's very, very thin. But there is materials floating above the surface of the moon on a routine basis. The Apollo astronauts talked about seeing colored lights in the quote-unquote sky above the moon, which conspiracists talk about being UFOs. What Laddie did was fly a very small spacecraft. It was actually off the back of a rocket called the Minotaur 5, which is an Aerojet Rocketdyne rocket that was powered by NK-33 engines. So the engines from the Soviet N-1 space program flew the mission that put this satellite into orbit around the moon to measure the elements of the exosphere, this very thin atmosphere around the moon. And what they discovered, or what they think they discovered, was that the glowing things that the, the Apollo astronauts talk about were actually concentrations of sodium. So the moon is largely made of silicates, of aluminum and, silic and, and silicates, and it's constantly bombarded by solar radiation. And solar radiation is protons. You know, the, moon is, the sun is mostly hydrogen, and as it's fusing things together, it throws some of that hydrogen into space at high velocity and highly energized. So these high-speed protons smash into the moon, and they make things. And sometimes they, energize, they, they, they end up making lithium and sodiums, and they will glow under that radiation. They also make argons, and, uh, and they make oxygen. And so once in a while, the, one of these protons is going to smash into the silicon oxides and yank that oxygen off. Now, the high level of radiation creates an electrical field, an electrostatic state, which is why the Apollo astronauts were covered in dust. The dust was highly electrically charged. It's like being in a big static ball all the time. And it's stuck to everything. It's going to be one of the problems of being on the moon, is dealing with all of that dust. Once those hydroxyls are energized like that, they float on those magnetic lines. And they can be pulled and moved great distances, perhaps into these continuously shaded areas, where they cool down because they're no longer in the sun and freeze and crystallize. So it may not be that the water and radicals that we find on the moon come from early impacts from the formation, from comets and things like that, but that the moon is continuously making them through the emissions of the solar radiation and its electrostatic field. We barely understand this. This is what Laddie hinted at, but it's a whole set of experiments we could do, and it speaks to billions of tons of ice being available on the moon as a consequence. Dan Andrews' next mission was going to be called Resource Prospector. And it was a small rover that they were going to precisely land on the moon near a continuously shaded area so that it could drive into that shaded area, dig up some of this material, bring it back into the sunlight so it had some power, melt the water out of it, and make themselves a vial of water just to see if they could do it. 
right? But it's like, we've done all these other experiments to say there's water on the moon. Let's go get a glass. <laughs> We're not going to be able to bring it back, but at least we'll say we got a glass of water on the moon. That mission got canceled last year. And it got canceled uh, without a lot of explanation. They already had a working prototype. They'd been testing it. It was a long way along. But NASA never throws anything away. When projects get canceled, plans, instrumentation, and hardware get put on a shelf. And subsequently, there have been announcements for NASA where they're going to provide a lot of technology like what was developed here for commercial operations and for other science missions. So as a new administration has come into play in the United States and they have new priorities, they're going to reuse these things. So this particular mission may have vanished, but there will be new missions. And of course, there are other people going to the moon. If you're keeping up with things, you know that China recently put a lander down on the moon on the far side. This is the Chang'e lander, and it also had a rover called Yulu-2. It's called the rabbit, essentially, that's been driving around the moon. I think it's no longer functioning, but China really showed off some serious technical prowess with this, not only landing something on the moon, which only a few nations have done, but also landing on the far side, which means they couldn't communicate with it directly. So part of their mission included putting up a satellite that orbits at the, roughly at the L1 location above the moon on the far side so that it can communicate with their lander and then back to the Earth. So that's genuinely a first for the Chinese, for, the, for, for humanity in the Chinese space program. And that this photo here is from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So the LRO, still doing its thing, has taken pictures both of the lander and its rover. So sort of identification that they, that mission's really there. The other mission I want to mention, and this is actually one that was part of the Lunar X Prize failure. This is uh, the Beresheet lander. This is from Space IL from Israel. This is an incredibly small, inexpensive lander. This was, again, attempting to try and win that X Prize by landing on the moon, taking some pictures, then it was going to hop about a half a kilometer and land somewhere else and take some more pictures. Uh, and when I, uh, I did this talk back in February, this mission was in flight. It is subsequently ended poorly. So they attempted to land in April, and they had data communication problems and tracking problems, and lost control of the spacecraft, and it landed. Just not well. So uh, still an incredible accomplishment to actually have flown the payload to get it all the way to the moon. Uh, to their credit, they streamed the landing tracking live. And so we all got to watch them lose the spacecraft together, for better or worse. Uh, the most remarkable thing about this, for an almost successful landing on the moon, under $100 million. Right, typical pricing for flying stuff to the moon these days, still running in the fifty dollars to $100,000 per kilogram range. And this is about 600 kilograms worth of spacecraft. So very, very inexpensive lander, admittedly with some work needing to be done. Uh, and so it's still congratulations to them. It was an extraordinary accomplishment. All right, let's talk a little about what NASA is doing. So uh, as of last month, with the Trump's initiative to do more in the moon, they want to accelerate getting back to the moon, they want to get humans back in the moon by 2024. And they did add some money to the budget, a whole $1.6 billion, which look, that's a lot of money for you and me but the current estimate for what they're actually attempting would be more like $30 billion. Uh, their main project from, from a NASA perspective is this uh, rocket called the Space Launch System. It's come and gone funding-wise a few times now. What they're trying to do is repurpose old space shuttle hardware to fly as a fully um, expendable rocket. So they're taking four of the shuttle engines as opposed to three that flew on the shuttle. They would take four at a time and an extended pair of solid rocket boosters, but otherwise they're the same kind of tech, in what is a dis completely disposable rocket, but very heavy lift. The, the original, the initial test, this is the EM-1 test, all the way on the left, would be an 87 ton, uh, metric ton capable rocket, that's considered extremely heavy lift, and with the improved second stage, it would be over 100 metric tons, which is now puts it in the Saturn class. So, equivalent to the top performing rockets. Now, they only have 16 of those old shuttle engines, so that's four missions. And then they have to figure out what they're going to do about the engines. The RS-25 engines from the space shuttle were built as reusable hydrogen-oxygen engines. 
They were reused many times. All 16 of those engines were previously flown on shuttle missions, and this is it going to use them up. They're going to burn them, and they're going to throw them away, which seems repugnant, seeing what we've seen SpaceX do, but that's what the design has been all along. There's some proposals for building new engines past this, but nothing's actually been done. Um, the mission at this point for uh, SLS is to build a space station around the moon. This is called the Lunar Gateway. Now, we have the International Space Station. That's all well and fine. And arguably, one would say the International Space Station is too large. This is an interesting next step to build a smaller station that orbits the moon. This gives us a place to put two to four people for an extended period of time, typically three or four months, with close view of the moon. They're only three days away if they need to come home. We get to experiment with a bunch of improvements in, in space station design. And the orbit is particularly interesting. The moon is lumpy. It, it has not got a very equal, reliable gravitational field. And so most vehicles that go into orbit of the moon do not last very long. The irregular gravity of the moon tends to destabilize satellites and the impact impacting. The lunar reconnaissance order is an interesting exception because they've gotten very good at adjusting its orbit to keep it orbiting efficiently. But most, if you can't just put something in orbit around the moon and leave it there, it will be gone in a year. Sooner or later, the disturbances from the surface will take it down. And so the orbit for the space station would be an odd orbit. This comes from a lady named Diane Davis. And she works on AI solutions at the Johnson Space Center. And I recommend you watching her whole video. But this is the orbit that they're suggesting, and it's the visualization of that orbit, for the Lunar Gateway. So the idea in this orbit is that it's a polar orbit, so it's going from north to south around the moon but it passes very close to the moon on the north end, and then it flies away from the moon on the south end. The period of the orbit for doing a full rotation is about a week. But six of those days, you'll have a very clear view of the south pole. So if you want to do observations and operations, like operating robots on the surface of the south, or on the south pole where the water ice is, this is a good place to be. It's also continuously in the view of the sun and continuously in view of the earth. So you don't have the problems that the current space station has where it keeps us doing 45 minutes in sunlight, 45 minutes in the dark, you need batteries. This is always in view of the sun, the way that it orbits around the moon, and always in view of the Earth. So it solves a bunch of problems. It also gives us a place to go. We know how to keep humans alive in a space station. We don't know how to keep humans alive on the moon for more than a couple of days. And so this is a staging point where we reliably put astronauts for an extended period of time near the moon while we work out the details of how to do the same thing on the surface. You know, starting with one of the biggest problems, which is precision landing. You can't build a base on the moon if you can't go back to it. So we need to solve that problem. Now, the recent announcements from the NASA side is this project called Artemis. And Artemis is the twin uh, sibling of Apollo, that's where the names come from, and it is a condensed schedule to get humans back on the moon by 2024. And now you get into this whole conversation of what a president talks about, what Congress is interested in, what NASA is capable of, and how much money is available. All right? Or simply stated, no bucks, no Buck Rogers. And so the additional 1.6 billion that was put in, which is useful, is nowhere near the sum needed to get by 2024. However, that doesn't mean that this particular action of Artemis, this series of missions to get humans back on the surface of the moon, hasn't borne fruit already. One of the examples is that first part of the lunar gateway is a, a module called the power and propulsion element. One of the things that the, space the existing space station cannot do is do its own station keeping. The Earth's atmosphere is always dragging on the space station, and so it gradually lowers over time. And so it needs a reboost on a regular basis. That is provided by the vehicles visiting the station. So when a Soyuz or a Progress or the uh, European uh, supply missions come up, they'll burn a little fuel to boost the station. It's one of the reasons we can't leave the International Space Station unoccupied. You need to operate it on a routine basis to keep it healthy. Now, knowing that the Lunar Gateway would be routinely empty, they include in the design enough power that it can station keep itself. 
And this module has now been ordered. They're actually going to build two of them. It's about 10 metric tons, half of which is xenon fuel. It's using ion engines. They're actually called Hall effect thrusters. And again, they sound like something out of science fiction, but we've been flying small Hall effect, uh, Hall effect thrusters for years and years. Clementine had one. These would be the biggest ever made, by far. The solar panels on this are called ROSA panels. They're rollout panels, and they're about 30 kilowatts of power each. That's about three times more powerful than a solar array on the space station. So they're very powerful solar panels, very powerful engines. Relatively speaking, this module has four engines on it. The combined thrust of those four engines is 1.7 newtons. Anybody know what a Newton is? So one Newton is roughly the amount of pressure exerted on your hand by an apple. Okay, it's roughly 100 grams of thrust. It'll, the, the ability to accelerate 100 grams at a meter per second per second. But it runs all of the time. The rough running time with fuel and full power of this thing is about 50,000 hours. You may not start out going all that fast, but it adds up. It's continuous acceleration over time. So it's actually quite a bit of power. This represents a real step forward in technology. And it's kind of a surprise, considering they just announced Artemis and they just announced a small amount of funding. How do they order this thing? Well, here's where we get into the, how NASA actually works where new projects are, are announced all the time and some money is put in and they do a little work on it and then it goes away. This same module was part of the asteroid redirect mission, this thrusting module, and they did a lot of design work then. This mission was announced back in 2013. You may have heard about this, to capture an asteroid and put it in orbit around the moon for us to ex inspect and do research on. Very cool idea, defunded in 2017 when the new administration came in but all the research they put into, you see the little box there? That's the same module. So they've taken that module with the additional funding, now they're actually gonna build it. And it's been ordered, they're gonna make one. And if we start thinking in terms of running supplies of the moon, this is the kind of base vehicle we need. Now, not just NASA working on moon-related projects, Roscosmos is the Russian entity. They announced a new rocket. The rocket is called the NSA, which is the name of a, a river in Russia. Uh, they're going to derive it from the Energia rocket. And the Energia rocket was the rocket that lifted the Buran space shuttle exactly once, right at the end of the Soviet Union. This is a 100 metric ton plus rocket design that only flew a couple of times ever. Kind of a wasted piece of technology. So they're dusting off the plans and they're, they're going to refit it uh, to be a modern rocket. We'll see how well funded that actually is. Same problem as every space program. They've also announced some new landers for the moon. So the Soviets landed a bunch of stuff on the moon. The last time they landed on the moon was the Luna, 25, uh, Luna 24 mission, which landed about 1970. Luna 25 was already built. So they kind of dusted off that hardware and are refreshing it a bit. And they're saying in 2021, they're going to fly it off of Soyuz and land it on the moon. And then they have a series of additional missions. So 25 and 26... That was the existing hardware from the Cold War that they want to refresh and put back to work, and then they're planning on building a few more. Again, we'll see how well-funded they are, but they're talking about putting out a resource lander, something to actually extract water ice, do that sort of resource prospector mission, and uh, even a, a return sample mission. So take some of those samples and fly them back to the Earth, which they did in the 70s. The, the, the Soviets had their own space rocks, that they actually picked up off the moon with a robot and then flew back home and, and re-entered them. And on the European side, there's a group called the International Space, Station, Space Exploration and Coordination Group, and they helped spec out that lunar, the, the, the lunar gateway, and they are talking about regular missions to the moon on the South Pole, roughly 40 day long missions. Now remember, it's a day-night cycle of 14 days, so that'd be 14 days of daylight, 14 days of night, 14 days of daylight, and exit. Uh, the Canadians, of which I'm one, have offered up rovers for this project. The Japanese have some designs for landing vehicles. So it's sort of a combined effort, all based around using that gateway as a staging point to go down and do missions onto the surface and back again. Now, if we're actually going to build stuff to stay on the moon, we're going to need structures. This is a design from the European Space Agency. 
uh, built by, largely by robots, so they would land an inflatable habitat with an airlock. It would remotely inflate, and then they'd use robots to bury it in regolith to give it enough uh, radiation protection to make it a place that humans could spend an extended period of time. So non-trivial amount of radiation being hit, pounding on the moon all the time. A couple of days is an acceptable exposure, but if you're going to stay there for a month, you need a bit more protection. Uh, Lockheed Martin has got this Jupiter space tug. This is largely derived from a design called the Cygnus that works uh, to supply the space station. And so this is a modified version with the ion thruster pack to allow it to fly to the gateway and back. The Russians have a similar design. I don't know how real this is, but it's a design they called the Rivok. And it would, again, put supplies onto the station. Its clever bit is when it comes back to the Earth, it actually skims the atmosphere to decelerate. And then it would go into orbit. You'd put more supplies on it, and the tug flies back to the moon again. So we've never made a really reusable in-space spacecraft before. So you can imagine the design of a spacecraft who only lives in orbits between the Earth and the Moon over and over again. And that's what these designs are about. A little bit about some of the commercial space. Let's talk about SpaceX. SpaceX, of course, fixated on Mars. You know, Elon's vision is to put humans, build a popula uh, uh, put a million people on Mars before he dies. Uh, but when the Moon got hip again, he did put out some artwork, and I'm going to call it artwork as it is, of his large or big Falcon rocket. That's what you want to call it landing on the moon and doing things. Now, the Big Falcon rocket isn't real yet, but they are bending metal for it. There's a project in Boca Chica called Starhopper that is a test for whether or not this rocket design will actually work. They have developed the first set of what they call the Raptor engines, or engines powerful enough to build a rocket this large. If, this, if what he says is true, and it works as proposed, it is a revolutionary rocket. It would be a 100% reusable rocket. Not just the booster, but also the second stage, the thing they're calling Starship, that they can return it and reuse that. Well, then you're getting more like an aircraft. I mean, right now, and this is Elon's words too, it's like we buy a 747, we load it full of stuff, we fly it to Australia, and then we throw it away. Which seems bizarre, but that's as much as we've been able to do with rockets so far. He's talking about making the reusable 747. That maybe that one works. The rocket he does have that works is a rocket called the Falcon Heavy. It's going to fly again next week. It, in theory, lifts up to 90 metric tons to low Earth orbit. In practice, the most it's lifted so far is nine, uh, but it's only flown three times. There was a mission at one point he was talking about with his crewed dragon to fly two people in uh, Apollo 8 style mission around the moon. Uh, and he was going to do it on the back of Falcon Heavy. Several problems with that. First is uh, the Crew Dragon is still in development. Uh, it is not rated to run on the Falcon Heavy. And we now know the name of the guy who wanted to propose that mission. And he was a billionaire up to a few months ago, where apparently now he's broke. So don't know where that moon mission is going to be. On the other side of the tech billionaires doing space stuff, Jeff Bezos is. Blue Origin. Blue Origin so far has only flown a suborbital rocket called New Shepard, but it does return and land back at base again, which is pretty cool, but it's not flying stuff into space. They are in the process of developing a rocket called New Glenn. And New Glenn is sub, uh, not only an orbital class rocket, but a super heavy orbital class rocket. Recently, he made announcements, actually it was two years ago, he first made announcements about we want to land stuff on the moon, we're going to build a vehicle called the Blue Moon Lander, and we're, we want to land, uh, we'll land up to uh, four metric tons on the South Pole. A month ago, he showed new mock-ups of a new lander and raised the total mass to six and a half metric tons. This is a lander a bit bigger than the lunar lander that has been on the moon, but completely robotic. Un, doesn't need to be manned. It's actually got not, hasn't got a sufficient power, although one of his demonstration or examples was it has a crane system that would actually drop four rovers at once onto the moon, which is cool, uh, but they have to extend this to actually be able to carry people on it. Uh, and he's also talked a lot about precision landing systems using optical tracking. So being able to figure out where you are by looking at the landscape and landing within 100 meters of target. That is a big goal right now with a lot of missions going on around the moon to try and do within 100 meter landings. 
because we've never landed closer than 20 kilometers so far. I mean, again, this is the non-sexy part of real space flight, right? We've never moved more than a few tons onto another body, and we've never been more accurate than a few kilometers. And if you don't solve those things, you don't get to build a base. But the base proposal is a big one. Shackleton Crater is on the, you know, almost completely on the South Pole, and this was a conversation about a design point where they would have a base and landing sites, and this is where they put the, the, the parts in. Now, I have an animation here of Shackleton Crater. This was made by LRO, repeatedly taking photos as it flew over Shackleton Crater. It is almost exactly over the South Pole. And so there are parts of that crater that never see light. But there are also parts on the crater rim that are almost continuously lit. So it's kind of like a place you could put solar panels and a place you can mine water. So it's an interesting location and probably sort of the highest candidate. The thing is we, don't un we can't grapple with how large Shackleton Crater is. It's 20 kilometers across. So Oslo will fit in this crater. Gonna be tricky to get it there, but just remember, this is really quite large, right? And it's six kilometers deep, the distance between the bottom of the crater and the top of that rim, that's a long way. So we need, certainly need precision landing, and a lot of this is the dance of where, how do we get power for an extended period of time, and how do we work in relevant areas? And so another project that's been heavily worked on is a form of nuclear power to, that is safe and reliable for moving, using on the moon. Now, we've all watched the Chernobyl series, so we're sufficiently freaked out about nuclear power at the moment. This is a much smaller system. So the reactor core in this diagram is about the size of a roll of paper towel. The whole unit is maybe two and a half meters high, and it's mostly radiator. It's cooling fins. This is about a 10 kilowatt power plant that will run continuously for 20 years. Small and light enough that you could actually fly it in a spacecraft. It's passively cooled, so basically it's walk, it, you know, the design is walk away safe. And this is a diagram, but this is the actual prototype. So this is hardware built by NASA Glenn, and it's near ready for testing in space. So you can imagine the potential of a device not a whole lot larger than me that'll make 10 kilowatts of electricity round the clock for a couple of decades. So you put this wherever you want, you have electricity. The real question is, what the heck to do on the moon? So there are a lot of resources on the moon. This is certainly something that Jeff Bezos was interested in. One of the reasons he's doing Blue Origin is to move polluting industries off the planet. So could he put a factory on the moon? Yeah, and I like this picture because somebody went to great lengths to actually take what is actually a gravel extractor and put it in like a moon setting, except for a couple of mistakes like, what's this power pole for, right? Why is that, or this one here, like what's that about? <laughs> and, and everybody likes my pointer? Pointer's good, yeah. So, but clever. What could they extract? Well, there really are ore bodies on the moon and they can, there's lots of aluminum, lots of iron, titanium, uh, potassium, the, the uh, rare earth minerals. Actually, it's all the ingredients for making solar panels, which is an interesting idea that we could manufacture solar panels on the moon. Solar panels are essentially crystals, and you kind of need gravity for crystals, but not a lot. Less gravity would actually be advantageous for growing larger crystals. So there's, there's a case to be made that it might be easier to make those crystals on the moon than it is to make it on the Earth. Now, we only need so much solar power on the moon, but we could use a heck of a lot more solar power in space. And if you look closely at this picture, you'll see the Earth there, and there's a little thing sticking off the side of that. That's the current most advanced design for a space-based power plant, a solar power plant called SPS Alpha. So this is a solar array for about a gigawatt of electricity. And just to give you a sense of scale, the bottom circle there that was pointed at the Earth would be about three kilometers across. This is big, and it's why we haven't made one, because lifting that to space is too expensive from the Earth. You, you, we measure lift requirements in delta V. You need to accelerate a mass to about 13 kilometers per second from the surface of the Earth to put it into orbit. But if you need to lift it from the moon, you need to raise it two kilometers a second. Oh, and by the way, no atmosphere. 
So you don't have all of those issues as well. So imagine the idea that we start manufacturing solar panels on the moon, and then we use simple accelerators to get that two kilometers per second to fling it back towards the Earth to assemble space-based power at geostationary orbit above the Earth, so about 36,000 kilometers from the Earth, which is where you'll orbit at the same rate that the planet will turn, so you can put it exactly where you want it. The moon's about 400,000 kilometers away, so it's a bit of a jump back and forth. But you talk about a clean gigawatt of power, this is about as clean as it gets. That's an interesting project. Probably a bit too advanced for our first efforts on the moon, but it is one of the things that people are looking at to do on the moon. Our existing space station's primary job is microgravity experiments, largely on humans. And we have learned a lot in the 20 years that we've had humans orbiting the Earth. The first part of the space station went up in 1998, while the Mir Space Station was still up. And by the time Mir came down, the, the International Space Station was continually inhabited. So we've had people in space since the 80s. One of the things we've found is that humans don't do well in free fall. Most of your bodily functions work fine. Your blood pumps, digestion works, but you can't burp. Well, you can burp. It's just that stuff's floating around in your stomach, so you don't only get gas when you burp. <laughs> and in fact, there's a demonstration a guy on the space station did where they've learned how to burp on the space station, where they sort of brace themselves against the wall, and when they go to burp, they accelerate, and it's all the food go down the bottom of the stomach, and then they can let the gas out. But if you get it wrong, you have to clean up your own mess. But there is one part of the body that does not function correctly in free for all, and it's cerebral spinal fluid. So there are two organs in your brain that produce the fluid that your brain sits in. And normally that fluid flows down into your spine. And in fact, people who are bedridden with illness are regularly sat up by nurses to cause that fluid to circulate. The fluid removes detritus from around your brain, carries it down to your spine where it's exchanged with your blood system and extracted from your body through your kidneys. When you go into free fall, that fluid accumulates in your head. It makes your face puffy, and you'll notice this in most astronauts, and the fluid accumulates enough that it actually presses against the back of your eyeballs. And so you'll notice that virtually every astronaut, while in orbit, wears glasses, because their eyes have been, shape has been changed. And the longer you're up there, the more extreme these effects get. And that's why they've set the time limit for astronauts in the space station to six months is they know after six months we can get you back onto the surface and it'll take you about a year to fully recover, but you will recover. Now you also have to exercise two to two and a half hours a day every day while in space, which is a non-trivial chunk, that's like 10% of your time of a given day consumed by that. But you're also, after six months, they carry you out of that spacecraft, right? You, you're impaired, which speaks to this whole idea, if we're gonna go to Mars, where our fastest flight time is about six months. Those folks that get to Mars, there's nobody there to help them. <laughs> so it's not reasonable for us to consider flying humans between planets without some kind of artificial gravity. Now there have been designs for artificial gravity. This is a design called Nautilus X. It's speculative, but it has a large rotating assembly, a centrifuge. The question is how fast do you need to rotate it? And there's a set of equations for figuring out how much to rotate it. Because when you're in a rotating surface, then the difference, the height of it matters a lot because the gravity is gonna be one thing at your feet, another thing at your head. And while you're rotating, if you walk and you turn, weird effects happen to you. So a 1G rotating sphere, a rotating uh, uh, cylinder that uh, is turning at roughly five RPM, is a good 30, 40 meters across to make it work. That's big, that's a hard thing to build. But what if we didn't need one G? What if we could go to a third of a G, which is Mars gravity, or a sixth of a G, moon gravity? Well then, it'd be easier to build by a lot. What we really need to know is how well does a human do in one sixth G over an extended period of time? And that's a really thing, hard thing to test, except on the moon. You can put humans on the moon for six months and actually see how they function. And this is what European Space Agency is proposing, is these extended research labs on the moon. Not that different from the labs we have in Antarctica. This is the Troll Research Station, where they do Earth science year-round in Antarctica, different crews coming and going. And I, you know, I'd be remiss considering where I am and not mention, like, Roel Amundsen got to the South Pole 
in 1911. His accomplishment is just not that different from Neil Armstrong 50 years ago. And we didn't have continuous habitation in Antarctica until the 1950s, 40 years after Roll first got to the pole. So here we are 50 years after Neil first got on the moon, and we're really talking about, could we set up research stations there? It's hard, but the, it's not like it's impossible, and it's not like it's unreasonable. Maybe it takes this long for us to get to a place in our civilization where we think about this seriously. And there's more to learn. This is a thing called the Marius Skylight. So remember I mentioned the most important rock ever found on the moon that recognized that there's volcanism on the moon? So there are lava tubes on the moon where lava flowed once, and as it cooled, the lava drained away, and it leaves this tube. And when it's close to the surface and it breaks through, it creates something like this, a skylight. So this is a view into a cylinder that runs some kilometers under the surface of the moon. The opening here is about 65 meters across and it's at least 80 meters deep. Maybe we don't build little hutches on the surface of the moon. Maybe we take an inflatable habitat and we put it inside a lava tube and inflate it in there. We can make much larger structures that way. It has built-in radiation protection. And there's a mission for the Japanese that actually want to put a small lander down with a rover to go to the edge of that Marius skylight and start taking some measurements. This gets back to that landing problem again, because you need to land close to the skylight, but not in it. So that 100 meter precision thing, may make it the right 100 meters. You gotta get right on. Other experiments we could be doing. Building radio telescopes on the far side of the moon. We create a lot of electro, uh, electromagnetic noise on the Earth. A quiet spot is the far side of the moon. And there's a proposal from the Naval Laboratory to basically use robots to lay out long strips of, of energy reflecting mylar and make a gigantic radio telescope on the far side of the moon. And just what would we see from that quiet space spanning around the universe on the far side of the moon? And not to put it too far in the nose, but we don't know much. If we dug down on the moon, who knows what we'd find under there? Now, admittedly, this is a very old movie, but I'm an old guy. <laughs> this, this is 2001 A Space Oddity, 1968, arguably the definitive space movie where they dug a hole in the moon and found a monolith. I'm not betting on the monolith. I'm also not betting on how either, which by the way was the first time most people ever heard the word artificial intelligence and it tried to kill everybody. <laughs> this is the slide that was given to me by the Ames folks that were keen to go to the moon and I used it because I thought it was lovely. The idea that the, we know, shouldn't fear the moon, it's only three days away, it has plenty of water, gravity and no weather. It is a place we can work from to learn all the things we need to learn to actually become a spacefaring race. If you like this, this link leads you to the .NET Rocks episodes we call the Geek Outs. There is a whole show, there is this, the older version of this talk, there's a whole show on space-based power and a number of other space and, our, and uh, alternative energy sources. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great conference. <laughs>